welcome to uh, From St. Patrick's Festival and I New NY to this particular story of Ireland and New York, Irish Town, a story of a New York neighborhood. I'm Dr. Miriam Nighan Gray and I teach at New York University's Luxman Ireland House and I'm also on the board of the African American Irish Diaspora Network. Today we are here to talk about the life, lives and changing futures of Woodside, Sunnyside, Queens, uh, where New York's Irish uh, were a primary ethnic group dominating the scene for many decades. Today I have the great pleasure to be in conversation with Sophie Colgan, Joe Crowley and Siobhan Dennehy. And before I introduce them more formally, uh, by way of general introduction, uh, I'd like to remark that the name Woodside and, uh, would be familiar to any Irish person with a family connection to or simply an interest in New York City. A residential and commercial neighbourhood in the borough of Queens, it became a surrogate home place for Irish uh, immigrants arriving in the city. By the late 1930s, we're told it was approximately 80% Irish and home to a very large Irish American community in the city area. It has subsequently supported generations of Irish immigrants in their search for work, play, connection and family in their new homes. But things are changing and have been changing. And in 2020, Irish Central, the leading Irish publication in the United States, published an article entitled Death of an Irish Neighbourhood and <laughs> detailed the dwindling numbers and changing nature of the community in Woodside, Sunnyside, describing it as describing it as the Irish fading away. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on the story and the history of uh, the, this neighbourhood and, and the conversation will reach from the particular life and character of the neighbourhood to its importance as a New York Irish community through the contemporary relationship of the New York Irish community with the neighbourhood, all in the context of the broader Irish experience as a whole and what the future might hold for that experience and for this unique and remarkable neighborhood. Any of us familiar with New York history know that uh, New York is always changing and reinventing itself. And this is a, a rich example of that story. Um, so we are joined today by uh, Congressman Joe Crowley, represented the people of New York's 14th congressional district, including his home town of Woodside, Queens, in the US Congress for nearly 20 years. The son and grandson of Irish American immigrants from counties Armagh, Cavan and Louth, Joe worked for decades to advance US-Ireland relations and secure peace in the north of Ireland. During his time in Congress, Joe served as co-chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Irish Affairs and a member of the Friends of Ireland Congressional Caucus, and he travelled to Northern Ireland during the peace process, including during the negotiations to restore devolved government in 2007. He also led congressional efforts in support of the grassroots peace building initiatives of the International Fund for Ireland, the key US funding mechanism bringing together people on both sides of the conflict. Joe was honoured by the American Ireland Fund Distinguished Leadership Award, the Queen's County St. Patrick's Day Parade Gale of the Year and the National Ethnic Coalition of Organisations Ellis Island Medal of Honour for his effort, efforts. Joe served in the House Democratic leadership for six years, first as vice chair and then as chairman of the caucus. He was also a member of the prestigious House Committee on Ways and Means and the Foreign on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. So welcome, Joe, and a pleasure to have you here today. Sophie Colgan is a communications, marketing and events specialist in New York City, program director of the Ireland US Council for Commerce and Industry and host of the Navigating New York podcast. She has emerged as a leading voice of the New York Irish community in and across the city and has connected and worked for many renowned cultural and business organizations on both sides of the Atlantic. A former New York Rose of Tralee and active member in the New York GAA, Sophie also boasts strong experience in work, networking, brand promotion and event coordination, both in the area of arts and culture and 
business development and welcome Sophie, great to see you. Siobhan Dennehy, Siobhan was born in Dublin and educated at Sign Hill and Trinity College Dublin before spending a summer on a J-1 visa in New York. While there, she joined the, the then grassroots effort and groundswell for immigration reform called the Irish Immigration Reform Movement, volunteering for the Woodlawn chapter in the Bronx. Siobhan started working at the National Basketball Association in the early 1990s, working with the league for almost a decade. In November 1999, she helped co-found sports marketing company Lead Dog Marketing Group and worked with the organization until 2001. We're also happy that she joined the Emerald Isle Immigration uh, in 2002 and has been executive director since February 2003. Since her appointment, the agency has seen growth in its budget, program and services. Accordingly, the centre has been able to add two attorneys, several immigration counselling staff and a social worker to meet the needs of the clients served. These clients so serve a broad spectrum of nationalities and the centre has added to the ranks of Spanish speaking staff to support the clients who continue to seek the Emerald Isles help. Siobhan has previously served as the board president of the Coalition of Irish Immigration Centres and she is currently the uh, LAOH National Immigration Chair, the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians. She lives with her husband Dan and they are the very proud parents of daughters Ashling and Cara and the family lives in Cortland Manor with Finn, their eight-year-old Jack Russell Terrier. So welcome all. Uh, it's a real treat uh, to have this opportunity uh, to chat to you today. Um, I suppose uh, if we kind of pick up some of the history of the Woodside and Sunnyside area, um, my understanding is that uh, like a lot of places around um, the outskirts of New York City, uh, as Manhattan um, became um, maybe slightly less attractive to some and they settled in New York over time, they moved out into the boroughs and um, the parts of Queens around Sunnyside, uh, Woodside, Long Island City, Astoria in the late 20th century or early 20th century in particular became very attractive uh, to immigrants and the children and probably grandchildren of immigrants who had um, been coming over in big numbers from Ireland from the the um significantly from the mid 19th century on joe i don't expect you to go that far back into the 19th century as such but can you tell me as someone whose deep roots and connections to the area a little bit about your perceptions of how woodside and sunnyside uh, evolved as a center of irishness in the middle to late decades of the 20th century well, even I would I would even start maybe in the 19th. I won't I won't spend a lot of time there. I, I wasn't living during that time, uh, although many would suspect I had been. Um, uh, you know, really Sunnyside uh, and Woodside at that time were really rural areas. There were there were farms um, in Woodside even in the early 20th century. In fact, my father fondly talked about raising Rhode Island red chickens in Maspeth, Queens, just uh, just. Just north, uh, sorry, just south of Woodside, um, and um, and really, it was um, the Irish have been living in Woodside uh, going back. I have a map here of of uh, Winfield, which was part of Woodside now, uh, going back to that's an 1857 map, and the names of McGowan, McKeon, Murphy, McCarthy, Moakley, Kelly, Keegan, Emmett, Frowley, Daly, Lanigan, Doherty, um, O'Connell. They're all replete here. And what was interesting about this, in all likelihood, these were uh, property owners. So it showed that there was a great, um, really, uh, presence of the Irish there, probably linked in some respects to St. Mary's Church, which is the, the oldest church in Queens, a Catholic church. It was uh, built in 1855. Um, and this doesn't even include the, the, the Woodside, the, the, the St. Sebastian's area sunny, of Woodside, which, which came later which was a, 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 I guess, a daughter church or, or, or son church of, of uh, St. Mary's being the, the root church. Um, it was a largely German as well as 
you know, a smattering of English names there as well. Uh, but it, it really showed the beginning. And I think these folks uh, in all likelihood were famine Irish, uh, but had been here maybe, you know, for some time if they owned property in, 1850, uh, in 1857. So that really uh, gives you some sense that this was um, a more healed, uh, well-heeled community. Uh, Sunnyside itself uh, got its name from Sunnyside Hill, uh, which which it was given in the early 1700s. Uh, but like Woodside was also very rural. And um, uh, it was with the development of the 59th Street Bridge and then ultimately uh, the uh, subway, which in Sunnyside and Woodside is the L, uh, the concrete L in Sunnyside and, and the iron L in Woodside, that really uh, transformed in many respects uh, the, 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 the use of the land. It moved from agricultural uh, and more towards um, uh, of, uh, of, of, of residence and uh, Sunnyside, in particular, was, was known for a place called um, the Celtic Arena, um, and where the Irish, many of uh, were the part of the Irish diaspora and other nationalities, trained for the Olympics and actually were in the Olympics. Uh, uh, and and it was a, a very very well known arena. Uh, is now home to the Celtic, uh, well, it was called the Celtic Gardens. Now it's called the Celtic Gardens, but it's, a, it's, a, it's housing, um, which shows, again, the, the rich Irish connection in Sunnyside and in Woodside. So the Irish have been there for quite, quite some time. My family didn't come over until um, I, my grandfather first came over in 1912 um, and my grandmother, his wife, in 1923. So for the most part, although there was some uh, of my family that came in the late 1800s for the the, the most part, um, the, the grounding took place uh, in the early uh, 1900s. And my grandparents bought their first home just outside of Woodside in Maspeth, but in St. Mary's Parish uh, in 1929. So that was basically kind of the rooting of the Crowleys in many respects uh, in, the, in the general vicinity. That's wonderful, Joe. It's uh, uh, fantastic that uh, you're able to map the demographics of Irish immigration to New York through your family in that way. Uh, such a, an interesting example, as you say, um, the upward mobility. We think of the famine Irish in kind of one dimensional terms at times. And of course, given the, uh, you know, huge numbers of Irish and um, opportunity in New York City, that sense uh, of uh, sometimes there being opportunities to buy land or to you know, get out of maybe, uh, you know, maybe tougher conditions in, in the city as they may have been out to this kind of new uh, green space and uh, ironically kind of a space that was probably more familiar to them um, than uh, what they might have experienced in Manhattan at the time. Sure. Mm -hmm. No um, doubt. And I, I just one other point, I think that you know, much of the land that was owned, for instance, the big six towers, which Siobhan would be very familiar with, that was once owned, that property was once owned by the Cavins Men Association and was sold oh, wow. to the big six, which is a local union, uh, the printers union to develop that housing, just as a, a little side note there in Woodside. Wow, wow, I, I, I had no idea. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, Siobhan, can you tell us a little bit about how, um, I, I mean, your own uh, uh, engagement with New York as an immigrant, but probably more mm -hmm. uh, directly uh, the, the work that you've been doing over the last couple of decades frames uh, your perceptions of uh, this part of New York as an Irish as an Irish hub and how that may has changed over time. Uh, certainly, I guess everybody has a. A, a different a different story. Um, my mine starts um, a personal journey, obviously, to America after graduating college um, and using the J-1 summer visa to come to America. Um, and was very very lucky to have had support and a family member who lived in Yonkers, just over the border from the Bronx. Um, so the first summer I spent here um, was my kind of journey into learning about New York, um, and I ended up working for off-track betting for the summer, which is no longer in, in existence, but it de definitely gave me a very unique um, look into that older generation of Irish who were of the betting variety um, and who, when they found out that there was someone working for the summer, I would do relief for holiday staff 
Um, so I could pop up at any off-track betting parlor. Um, and I found out that the Irish in particular were very superstitious, but very interested in connecting with Ireland through placing their bets with me, which meant that I was the most popular clerk in any betting parlor that I went to. But I just, I learned that the, um, the connection with Ireland was there on that doorstep. Um, and that was the summer of kind of 87, roll on for about a year. I learned a little bit more about New York. Um, I was still in New York. Um, and at that point, I was undocumented, um, but I joined probably another couple of hundred thousand more who were in the same situation. And it was through a very good friend um, who worked for the New York Times, um, who was a member of the Cork Association at the time, um, Jerry Mahoney, he, he was a paper handler. Um, and he suggested that myself and my, now he's my husband, my then boyfriend should get involved to do something about immigration. Um, and getting involved meant leaving the Bronx, leaving Yonkers, but going to Queens. Um, it was funny, Joe, you mentioned the Cavan Association and their ownership of a building. Well, I think at the time, the only association in New York in the late 80s to own a building was the Cork Association. Um, and they were there right on the border between Long Island City and Sunnyside. Um, and out of their membership um, certainly grew the reform movement, grew the Irish immigration reform um, entity. And from that, it, it became this you know, incredible groundswell where people were connecting without social media, um, but were absolutely on the road to having a part in changing American immigration history. Um, but again, the tie was to Queens. Um, subsequently, I learned that obviously there are, there are more Irish born in Queens than any other um, borough in the city. And that is certainly um, held true to today. I know we do an awful lot of work with um, immigrants of, of varying ages, but it's always surprising to me um, that in the entire borough of Queens, the concentration would obviously still be the sunny sides, the wood sides, the Maspeths, Middle Village perhaps, but then other, other areas as well. Um, those, those are where the, the Irish centered and where they came to. And in, inevitably it was because I think you came to someone that you knew there um, you were going to, you know, maybe spend a summer on a couch, um, get yourself started and then go venture out into finding, finding a home. Um, and Woodside in particular, I think to this day still offers um, incredible access to, sit, to the city, incredible access to mm -hmm. work, um, the proximity that you can be in Manhattan in, you know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes out of Woodside on the, the seven train. Um, and then even if you go Long Island Railroad, you can be in Penn Station in nine, 12 minutes. I mean, that offers an incredible opportunity for, for access to work and that economy to sustain you um, when you're there. So um, I guess I ro roll on after the immigration reform movement. Um, the, I, I worked in corporate America, so had a different view um, of many, many neighborhoods in the entire country. Um, and in 2002, I became what you probably call a reverse commuter. I would literally come to work every day in Woodside. So my vision of Woodside is coming into an Irish neighborhood, living in another one, um, but making that commute out to Woodside um, and, and noting the incredible ethnic diversity then, and that was 20 years ago, Joe, to pick on kind of like your time frame as well, um, 20 years ago, and then to watch um, the neighborhood gradually change even more if it was possible. Um, I know when Joe was congressman, we would use um, a, a statistic very, very frequently in the immigration world that within a one mile kind of radius of where our office was based in Woodside, um, there were over 100, and, or there are over 120 languages spoken every day. So this area beckons obviously not just the Irish, but many, many different ethnic groups because um, of, of everything that's available to it um, in terms of a community where you raise a family, um, rent a home, buy, aspire to buy a home. Um, and that offers so much in terms of a neighborhood. And as I say, that's just for me going in there to work every day as opposed to um, having actually lived there. So the work that we're doing um, at the center every day absolutely transcends that. 
we're helping constituents um, from over 70 countries. Um, and that's just, you know, helping them on the road to their immigration, um, the end of their immigration journey as we see it in attaining U.S. citizenship. So very, very diverse community. That's wonderful, Siobhan. Thank you for sharing those uh, rich reflections. Um, you must have been very young when you came to America, is all I can say, when you're going back into the 80s there. And more recently, I suppose, Sophie, you you have made the same journey as myself and Siobhan um, and Joe's ancestors to some extent. Uh, how did you engage with Sunnyside's uh, Woodside as an Irish community, as a, a more generally? Uh, what are your perceptions of it in the more recent experience? Yeah, well, I, I firstly, I really am enjoying learning and sort of expanding my own knowledge on the history of Woodside and Sunnyside. Um, as maybe, you know, a, a newer immigrant here, I've been in New York for almost eight years and I have a real fondness um, for the community in Queens, especially Woodside, Sunnyside and um, Long Island City. And I, I live in Jersey on the other side of, of Manhattan, but I find myself commuting across Manhattan to go to Queens for various reasons um, more often than you would think because the the young Irish community there is, is very much thriving um, in terms of my own, like, early engagement with Queens. My first um, summer here, like Siobhan, on a J1 summer, I came between my third and final year of of university in Belfast. And I worked um, as a as a host in a in a famous um, pub in the city right beside Grand Central called Annie Moore's. And it's now closed. But I it was a real experience for me to, you know, get a feel for what New York City had to offer. And um, I stayed with a friend that I met through work, uh, a lovely girl from Limerick, and she lived in Woodside. And I had previously been staying for a while in, in Woodlawn in the Bronx, again, a really, really strong Irish community there. But when I went to stay in Woodside, I really was blown away by this you know, atmosphere there that I felt was really, it felt like a little Manhattan to me because, you know, you you have that view of the city, the commute is so, you know, so short. And as Joe mentioned, the diversity in cultures is really what you think about when you're, you know, what you, you imagine New York to be like. And I think Woodside and Sunnyside really has that um, in abundance. And as an Irish immigrant, it's really important, I feel, to the younger generations that are moving here to immerse yourself in all cultures, you know, very much leaning into our own. Um, and I feel like over the, the past few years, I'm noticing that young Irish uh, immigrants here in New York are leaning into their heritage more so maybe than they had had done in the in the years just before COVID and that that's just sort of a personal reflection of mine because um I feel like as again as Siobhan mentioned um we connect now on social media and when we look back at the the period of time that Joe was was talking about and and the associations Miriam that you mentioned um as a community Irish people used to meet in person and they used to meet regularly at various um, functions with associated with different clubs and associations and um, orders and and unfortunately that just had to stop for you know the pandemic but also I feel like working in um, the the sort of world of of events I I feel like those um, there was we were seeing a bit of a struggle with getting people to commit to membership in various organizations like they had been because there's so many other ways to connect now right so um but what i what i've always really noticed about uh the, the various sort of smaller parts of queens is that they're such um such a vibrant sort of community of irish people and if you look just recently there's been a new GAA club formed in um, in Queens uh, called O'Donovan Rossa, um, and the women's team there are thriving. They have the biggest membership. So the the New York Ladies Gaelic Football Association this year celebrates 30 years um, of of 
uh, existence. So they started in, in 1992 and there was a couple of clubs formed originally up in the Bronx. And typically, even when I moved to New York eight years ago, all of the, the Gaelic uh, games were focused in the Bronx. Luckily, I had... Um, came just one year after the club I am now associated with, Manhattan Gales, had formed, who were the first Manhattan-based Gaelic football club in New York. Um, and so we it started off with very small numbers, has obviously grown substantially, which is great. Um, and I think, you know, the sort of older time GAA uh, Gales here in New York were surprised to see this sort of Manhattan-based uh, team being formed. And because we had so many players commuting from Queens to join the club in Manhattan and to join our trainings, then the Queens, um, a, a group of girls in Queens started their own club two years ago, Donovan Ross's, and they have a membership of 60 60 ladies wow. for one team so and we you know we hate to see them coming because they have the best of the best of everyone because so many new and uh irish born immigrants come and they go to queens because they know woodside and they know sunnyside and they've had cousins and uncles and ancestors who've lived there um and and so i feel like as i um as i sort of navigate um, the younger Irish community and speak to people in, in New York and all of the boroughs, I can't help but but really be enthralled by how Queens has has this very vibrant and very much, um, you know, inclusive sort of Irish community. So there's also so many recently I've seen, you know, women's Irish women's groups, networking groups that aren't necessarily associated with a sport or with um, an activity, but more like support groups that are being um, formed in Long Island City. Um, there's a, a new group called the Shared Space, which is basically a, a space for young Irish women or Irish women of any age really to come together and support one another after they've, you know, gone through something that might be slightly stressful or that they might not have, you know, the roots that they once had in Ireland. So there's also various, you know, I, I also feel like in, in Queens, when you look at places like the New York Irish Centre, there's there they, are places that are really thriving, you know, because I notice as well, people of my my generation are, again, as I mentioned, leaning into their Irish heritage, you know, um, they're they're going back to take to learn Irish language again and, you know, get involved in the community and lean into to our sort of culture and heritage in this city, which I think is is really positive, you know, um, from the perspective of, of someone who's relatively new here. That's great, Sophie. I, I'll never forget when I came to New York doing my doctoral research, um, I probably interviewed a lovely Mayo man 2006 or 2007, and he coined it so well. He said, um, Miriam, the county associations, and he could have been talking about the GAA because he was involved in that. The point was these organizations were the internet of the day. And he really coined it when he said that because to we've touched you've all touched on that in different ways in terms of how we organize, how we come together as a community. But I do want to get your sense of and your opinion on um it's not as Irish a hub visibly as it used to be. Maybe Joe, if you could talk a little bit about how um, how we uh, and and that's New York. You know, places change, new groups mm -hmm. come in, groups move out. That's all part of the story. The the wonderful richness of the place is that it doesn't remain static. Uh, can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about maybe how Joe and when you notice distinctive changes in the communities in Woodside and Sunnyside in terms of the dominance of Irishness? Well, I think Siobhan touched on it earlier. I think uh, Queens in particular has always been a, uh, a refuge for, uh, for immigrants um, writ large. You know, back when the World's Fair um, in the 1960s was put on, uh, there was uh, some, um, there, 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 it, it wasn't your typical World's Fair because of the way which was done. Robert Moses was very strong handed. And many of the traditional countries that would have participated didn't participate. But many of the countries that normally would not have had such highlight, like Bangladesh, um, like uh, the East, uh, the Asian countries, uh, some of the South American countries, 
they were highlighted during that World's Fair in, in Queens. And it's interesting that when you go forward 50 years, 60 years later, that's exactly who are the people making up the, the new immigrant population within Queens. And, and Woodside has been no stranger to that for, for, for decades. Um, I, I think like not unlike other communities, I had an African-American pastor from uh, East Elmhurst come to see me one day and he said, Congressman, you have to do something. I'm losing my 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 parishioners there. They're going elsewhere. They're not they're not staying in the in the neighborhood. And I that that's very typical of neighborhoods. When when your mother and father live there and you grow up, you 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 know, you're moving from your parents' home and that the asper starts to take place. And I think for many of the Irish it was they went to as as Shivana mentioned, she mentioned Middle Village and Maspeth and Glendale and other parts of, of Queens County uh, or other parts of the city and New Jersey um, as well that people moved to. Um, and when their parents die, they have the house and they sell it and they divide it amongst themselves. That happens to all communities. So um, I, I also at the same time think the death knell for the Irish community in Woodside is premature. I think we'll always have some flavor of Irishness. Uh, but not unlike, you know, the Irish who, who dominated in, in politics and in public life in New York for for decades, and some would argue for a century, um, there were new immigrant groups that are coming in every day and leaving their mark, and it won't stay like this forever either. This will continually uh, churn and change. Uh, I think one of the other last things I'll mention is that maybe the lack of a, um, I think because of the restrictive nature of uh, our immigration laws and policies, it, it has really held out. Uh, another strong wave of Irish to come uh, and to supplant those who are in Woodside and Sunnyside and elsewhere as well. Uh, and they've looked to other parts of the United Kingdom, whether it's England or Australia or, or Canada or elsewhere, where they have more easier access. Um, and, and as well that Ireland itself is doing much better uh, economically than it uh, had in the previous centuries. So I think all the above contributing to that factor. But I, as I'll, t I'll just end on this, I think I think Woodside will continue to have that flavor, uh, simply for no other reason. Uh, the Catholic churches and the Irish bars that in restaurants it'll be fixture for some time. And the and the butcher block, Joe. We all go to the butcher, butcher block. block. the butcher block. <laughs> There's a free ad for the butcher block, Siobhan, um May I ask you, you know how that 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 Joe brings up such an important issue in terms of you know anyone familiar with the history of Irish immigration into the United States you know we see the wave of the 20s and we see the people coming in after World War II and we see the people coming in the 80s and and into the early 90s but really it's very challenging as a as a young aspiring um, New Yorker from Ireland to get over and come through. How have you um, in your organization adapted to that? I suppose um, in part that also speaks to uh, you expanding your reach into other ethnic groups. But if we kind of focus on the Irish a bit, do you do you see those pathways improving or how have you adapted to to kind of um, to deal with that uh, restriction? Well, I guess the, the biggest lesson that I guess we have to learn in all of that is to be patient. Um, there are so many and have been so many opportunities over the last 20 years that we've all hoped to see um, some change in immigration reform. Um, and we need to continue to be patient and to continue to hope that we will see um, a benefit that will change and, and will offer a better path into this country, not just for ourselves, um, but for many, many, many different ethnicities. Um, we were watching, we're looking to see currently how many undocumented we still have here in the country. And that's not just an Irish issue. It's something that affects many other con countries. Um, we're gonna watch and see how we can help the individuals that are still here. But at the same time, there's, as you've just, you know, very, succinctly point, pointed out, there are no pathways in. And as Joe's mentioned, there are other pathways out of Ireland at the minute. Um, the whole of Europe beckons Ireland and um, an educated, well-educated, youthful Ireland um, is definitely looking at opportunities there. Um, we're convinced, however, even with, you know, there's been a population growth in Ireland. Again, I'm aging myself out when I think about the Ireland I left had maybe a population of 3.8. It was under 4 million. Um, the, and that's the Republic today. 
um, is in excess of 5 million individuals who live there. Um, and within that, we are very, very frequent recipients of individuals who want information on how to get to America, um, how to do it legally, how to do it on maybe more of a temporary basis. Um, and there are some kind of minuscule plans and programs available. Um, there's a 12 month visa um, open to recent Irish graduates. We would love to see that being extended to a longer term. Um, the ability to come to New York and use all of the great connections in Woodside, if that's your, your base when you arrive, you know, that's only going to be um, a viable option for somebody if you have a little bit more time to spend here. I mean, we definitely see the challenges that continue to face the summer visas, the 90-day visa holders who get to come and live and work in America for a summer and be part of that entire cultural exchange. Um, you know, we've... We've had the arrivals literally come to the door directly at Emerald Island Woodside straight out of Kennedy um, looking for help with jobs and accommodation. Um, and that's something that we will continue to do and we look for help and support um, with that because that's what the community needs to see in terms of the future, um, that that connectivity with Ireland can remain, can be sustained. Um, and we, we need to follow every avenue I think possible in order for that continued immigration flow to happen. And, and through that, we get the benefits of everything we're looking for, for the organizations that exist. I mean, if Sophie has talked and touched upon people leaning in to their culture and community, we welcome that. We need to see that. We need to see all of these meaningful organizations continue the work. And it's, it's never been as apparent as a community for us when we're faced with a tragedy or when we're faced with a pandemic, um, but just citing in recent experience, the, the Sandy, um, the hurricane that kind of literally decimated parts of that Eastern coast, but it took a hammering at Queens. Um, and you realize then how big the borough is when you're based in Emerald Isle and Woodside and you're going out to provide relief to the Irish who are in the Rockaways, um, to those who are in, um, just over the border in Island Park. And then you realize how a community can come together from all of the places that we're living today, be it New Jersey, be it Connecticut. Um, and that was a really, really impactful contribution back from all of the immigrants to help those in need. I think it was even further highlighted more recently with um, the pandemic and the incredible work that was done at the MEHA level with all of the support that Sophie led um, out there, making sure that PP got into the hands of those who needed it. Um, and then the Slauncha initiative, which I'm, I'm just so proud to have been a part of, but the Ashling Center in Yonkers took the lead on that. And we were happy to row in with help from New York Irish Center and other organizations and the Irish government um, to provide support and help and effort. And, you know, that's, that's what an Irish immigrant has to offer this country um, in terms of what we're able to do when those are in need. And I think we'll be stepping up again. We'll be stepping up to help our Afghan refugees and certainly the Ukraine um, in this crisis um, and do what we can because it's all part of that immigrant experience. Thanks, Siobhan. Sophie, I suppose um, your work and engagement and some of it uh, Siobhan has, has referenced there, um, you draw on some of the very traditional mechanisms of connecting Irish people together, the GAA and, you know, those those traditional kind of bells and whistles of Irishness abroad. But you also use the new technology, the podcasting and the social media and, you know, all that modern technology has to offer. I make myself sound really old in the way I frame that. But you know what I'm saying? You're kind of drawing on the combination of both. Um, how do you look to the future in terms of that richness of being able to reach uh, a really wide audience and uh, for you to be able to kind of skip over and connect from, you know, Jersey City into the city and mm -hmm. like, over to Queens and things like that so easily. Tell us a little bit about how you look to the future uh, and your activities in that vein. That's a great question, Miriam. Um, and I, I really echo what Siobhan has said there that the future, what I do worry about is the future of our, of our 
community here in terms of the number of young people that can get into the country and get into the city and access work um, and insurance and all those things. And, and I feel like you know, almost subconsciously through the pandemic, I felt like, you know, creating a podcast, a, a sort of a virtual space where I could get, you know, you know, I could facilitate conversations that might help these people who are either, you know, hoping to come to New York, Irish people hoping to come to New York or people here who might feel a little bit lost, because I think it's important to to also mention that, um, it, it's been a it's been a rough couple of years for all sorts of um, of immigration or sorry diverse groups in New York um, and that we as I find myself you know counting my lucky stars that I come from you know quite a privileged um, uh, diaspora and and not that that is in any way undeserved because the Irish have worked so hard to be you know where we are in this city and. But the, the truth is, is the fight's still not over because when, you know, I I look at, you know, how we can facilitate and sort of build upon the work that the Emerald Isle Immigration Centre do, you know, day in, day out is is to sort of provide a resource for um, for young people that are hoping to move to New York. Because as, as Joe mentioned there, it's really apparent to me that so many young graduates are trying to come here um, to New York, but there's also, not only are there, you know, time constraints on the visa period, but there's new, um, there's new sort of rules in which that you have to have a job lined up, even now on the J1 three month summer visa. And, and even just looking at my experience eight years ago where things were, you know, not that they were looser, but they were easier. You know, you had a bit more time, you had some grace period, you had, um, now that it's just stricter, the restrictions on what, and, and the things that you need to do in order to get, get your visa validated. And you only have a certain amount of time to do that. You see young people coming here and they're very much under pressure. Um, and that's my sort of, uh, social media inboxes right now are just filled with people saying, do you know anyone who would hire me for three months or any internships or what can I do to find accommodation? Um, so I guess the future of, to answer your question, Miriam, of, of how we can continue to unite and, and, and create a strong community and support system for both new immigrants here and the existing ones is to, you know, really sort of promote what exists and that framework that has been so you know incredibly built by organizations that are represented here um and the various other ones that have been mentioned and i feel um that really all i'm doing is kind of paying lip service to the work that has already been done and that i feel you know just to sort of summarize why i started this uh, the podcast navigate new york is that in my various uh, roles within Irish American organizations in New York, I got a front row seat to hearing the stories of our history, our heritage, our culture of, you know, having conversations with people who have been, you know, you know, here, there and everywhere in New York and have, have had lows and highs and have, you know, whether that be artists, whether that be, you know, uh, business owners. And I, I felt like I got this, you know, almost like a, a crash course in how to navigate New York myself because I got to meet so many incredible Irish Americans um, and, you know, Irish born people who had done it before me. So um, with with not only the pandemic stopping us from meeting in person, but also, you know, clubs and organizations and county associations maybe seeing that fall away in attendance um, just because of the nature of how we connect. I feel like um, as we sort of develop uh, our message and our support as a community to new immigrants, it's just important to keep up um, with how how those uh, immigrants are are receiving information. Um, so I guess we'll be having like Emerald Isle Immigration Center TikTok videos or or something coming next because I think we just all yeah all we can do is sort of keep up with with how people are are consuming their information and be as supportive as possible for that. Thanks, Sophie. I mean, one of the things I love about the Sunnyside Woodside area is it always has that kind of range. And I suppose, Joe, you've had a front row seat at that as a as someone with deep connections to the place in terms of Irish Americans, you know, many generations in the place and then right through the spectrum, spectrum to the to the newly arrived. And I love 
um, the way um, the geography and the businesses and the community and the churches and the organizations in Sunnyside and Woodside, uh, Woodside um, kind of uh, oxygenate those connections. One of my favorite couples in New York City uh, were our Bridget and Jim Cagney, who uh, anyone who was familiar with the Irish landscape of New York were familiar with this couple. They had come to New York as Irish immigrants in the 1960s and lived there and absolutely loved all that um, we've described today in these communities had to offer coexisting um, the Irish American and the, um, the Irish immigrant experience. Um, thank you, Joe, Sophie and Siobhan. Um, it's been my pleasure and honour to moderate. I'd like to thank David and everyone um, at INY for uh, having us uh, uh, chat today. It's a, it's a real treat uh, to have this opportunity. And may I take this opportunity to wish you all a happy St. Patrick's Festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Miriam. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. Thank you, I Miriam. Hope, I I hope that was okay. <laughs> I don't know.